so crazy. First thing Reagan does is fire their air traffic controllers. So, yeah, I do think though we're going to see a much greater support for labor actions generally moving forward because people have had very bad conditions for a very long time and it keeps getting worse. I think honestly the Republicans are pretty quiet about it because they've found an alternative place to unify their tribe, which is on all the, the woke stuff. Right. Um, like I, I haven't seen any Republican Congress people be like, oh yeah, strikes bad. Um, so may, maybe it'll be a little different. I mean, I think they tried to kill unions and you know, now they're getting the results slapping back there. Um, at the start of the call, I, I mentioned that I was worried that the two big strikes that have been going on, the writer's strikes and actor strikes and the UAW strike might cause Republicans to vote more. And Aram pointed out that 65% public approval on these strikes and that there, we may be in the middle of sort of a, the backlash against the backlash. Uh, you know, the, 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 what was it, the counter movement from Polanyi? Um, I, I, and I don't know. I mean, I, I remember... I remember several elections back, Gavin Newsom made gay marriage uh, legal in San Francisco or whatever else. And like, there was a burst of, of happiness and that was like three months before the election. And I, I could just feel that great action, miserable timing because it lit up a bunch of people on the right who went out and voted, I think. I don't, I don't remember my evidence or whatever, but I, I think there was a like a, a, like a pickup. And, and I sometimes I worry about the timing of, of these kinds of things. Yeah, I don't know. I do think that, like, the capability of the GOP to be anti-labor is increasingly difficult now. Uh, and so I think they're going to try and double down on the woke stuff and their protests there and try and pretend that none of the labor stuff is happening in order to avoid taking a real position on it. Because that seems to be what they're doing now. Because weirdly, somehow, somehow, weirdly, Republicans became the party of every man in middle America and the worker when it used to be Democrats. And Democrats are now elites and whatever, whatever. And I'm like, wait, how did that role swap happen? I think you need you need a new parties, maybe. How do you consider this? Oh, I've, <laughs> I've considered it. I've been waiting for a decade for Mitt Romney to take a couple of actual conservative Republicans and go start a new party, but now he's retiring out. Um, yeah. but, but he I, I sort like, of killed any sort of ability he had to do that. Why? When? Uh, Mitt Romney, when he ran. Well, uh, <laughs> I, no, I, I, no, I don't mean for him to run at the head of that ticket. I mean, for him to take a bunch of conservatives and say, let's start a new party and whoever rises to the top of that party could run, but let's let's split off. Like there used to be Democratic Republicans and that died and then that got remixed into the Democrats and the Republicans. And we had Whigs, well, that, we had Whigs early on, right? That That's what happened to um, almost everybody who is in the center of the Republican Party left or quit or retired as a means of getting out because it wasn't worth the emotional labor and backlash they were getting themselves for yeah. being, you know, you know, whatever it is that side really is after now. I'm not sure other than we just like to complain. Yeah. But I did hear, you know, Newt Gingrich this morning, oh. who I think is also, he's certainly a little further to the right than center. But I don't think he's Trump crazy right. But he this morning was saying, hey, you know, Biden, I think it was on NPR. He's like, Biden's trying to get all this support from labor, but already the little guy is on Trump's side. So it's where does that split come out between do you identify as labor or a labor who needs the unions or do you identify even more with you know kind of that trumpist yeah. flavor i mean and i where think does that's, that split come out that's got i think that's going to be the big one yeah i mean i think the interesting hack that's happened in the sort of overton window of who gets to consider themselves labor right is we're seeing like uh, managers and wealthy, ultra wealthy people and uh, 
like landlords all use the language of labor to defend their profit making uh, and the GOP, right? Like they support that approach. I think there, there was a re- talking about Trump, right? There was a really interesting news story, which was uh, Biden's off to the picket line for the UAW and Trump is also off to the protests, but it turns out what he's doing is meeting with management, hmm. but right. Like they have understood how to paint that in such a way that it's like, well, we're all, you know, working in America, etc. So, well, I, I'm still waiting for the group of workers and contractors and laborers who were all stiffed by Trump to come back out of the woodwork while this is going on. And I have heard next to nothing. So I read I read uh, The Making of Donald Trump by David K. Johnson before the 2016 election. And I was like, there have been 4,000 lawsuits brought against Trump and the Trump Organization for exactly the kinds of things you just n- named. Like he just, he'll take somebody's invoice and say, well, I, I don't think the work, the, the work was worth it. And maybe I'll pay you half. Maybe I won't pay you at all. Take me to court. Good luck. Yeah. And, and I was like that and a whole bunch of other stupid stuff. And I was like, how is anybody going to elect this guy to, to be there? And they did like, I, it was weird. Then um, this is a thought back when Obama, back when, uh, Obama was trying to pass uh, um, the health care stuff, I was like, he should start a, a, a fireside chat-like thing, pick a day, do a podcast, and invite in people to tell their horror stories about the existing death panels. Because remember, the, the Republicans mobilized death panels as, as what was going to happen under centralized health care. So what we got with Obamacare was basically a camel or a platypus. It's this hybrid creature that's not really what anybody wanted to build. Um, but it passed and it's resisted like 20 assaults on it uh, by from the right. And I've, I've cataloged all those assaults in my brain. But I was wishing that Obama would sit down and like just interview people who've already suffered and say, screw you with this death panel thing. You, you already have death panels. And so the same thing could happen right now. It's like all the people who've been stiffed by Trump could be on a, on a talk show and, and, and like a little drumbeat every week they could drop stories and tell who died, who did what, you know, who committed suicide because whatever. And it would be pretty fabulous. It would make good media. I think the left has no idea how to respond to the far right. And the far right has gotten so ballsy and so uh, they've broken so many norms and decided that like just being ballsy and repeating it seems to work. Uh, The left doesn't really know how to respond. The question though is where do you put that drum beat in a place where anyone who needs to hear it is going to hear it on versus the, on the inner tubes on TikTok for Christ's sake. I don't know. You put yeah, it someplace maybe. where people can remix it and go go mess with it. Yeah. A podcast, right? That seems to be how the right's doing things. Yeah. I don't know though. There is like a really interesting conversation I've been pulled into a couple of times about how like podcasts have become like an intrinsically right-wing medium which i'm not sure i agree with but i understand like the argument that's being made there it's called hot take uh, no? what's that it's like a hot take it seems like you know like yeah uh, it's a hot take <laughs> yeah, yeah so in which way is that true well i mean like you look at something like um like the the Daily Wire, um, or a bunch of these other things where it's, I I think what people are really seeing is that the, the content policies are significantly worse for audio podcasts than they are for anything else, right? If you put up video, then that's difficult to host yourself and difficult to distribute. So you need to be on YouTube or you need to be on Twitch. And they're going to moderate you if you start spouting out really hateful shit. Um, And if you write stuff, like you need a platform. And if it gets too bad, we saw what happens with Stormfront, right? You get delisted from the entire DNS system. Um, But on the other side of it, like with podcasts, one, they're very difficult to scrub through. Two, like Spotify doesn't do anything, right? They paid for Joe Rogan millions and millions of dollars. Um, Neither does iTunes, neither does any of them, really. Trying to get a podcast off of all of the platforms that it could be on, very difficult. 
And then the final thing is the pressure point on these things is very often the ads where you shame the advertisers for being associated with it. And it's extremely difficult to capture an advertisement happening on an audio podcast. And I think that combination of things is it's less that the format is intrinsically conservative mm. and more that the moderation tools are poor and wherever moderation tools are poor nowadays you get more the niche. Of fascism. interesting i yeah. really i love that observation around thank you <clears throat> that's really like i hadn't thought about it that way so here you can imagine like of course a uh, uh, platform improvements right um uh, so uh, speech to text being presumably improving yet and uh, improving in the near future uh, it should be that podcasts become as easy to parse consume detect and maybe moderate as text it should be but there's an extra step so i, I could totally see that uh, taking some some time still i think part of the problem is that the podcast platforms the the, the rebroadcasters <clears throat> are so diverse and tiny and hard to police like you couldn't come after them where where if you want video scene you go to YouTube yeah here I, I guess I don't know if we want other it's advocate but then I always I think you know the Fediverse for example I mentioned the Fediverse often you know the Fediverse has some version tools in general it cannot be moderated as a whole what the best we the best that they can happen in the Fediverse or is happening currently you know the tools we have is like it's sort of like you can fork so then you have like all the Nazi and troll instances sort of like floating or and maybe federating with each other if they don't care. And the more constructive side of the Fediverse who defederates with those. So essentially you have you get like a sort of like a split in the network. And the question is always, do we care about what goes on in the areas of the Fediverse uh, which we don't federate with? Which we could also define to be outside the Fediverse, sort of by definition, depends on the definition. Um, and this goes into like the question, I mean, I don't know, to put it bluntly, do we care about Nazis being Nazis if they are only Nazis between themselves? Is that actually realistic or is the definition of Nazi one that goes and enforce, uh, enforce their Naziness on others, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know. I guess like uh, the liberal take will be let the podcast, uh, like, you know, be uh, some podcast be right wing uh, or like even like uh, beyond and just don't listen to those, but I don't know. Then we, unsolved, we no? quickly trip into the, the free speech and what uh, what are the boundaries of free speech question? Right. Yeah, exactly. It's so complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it is very interesting to think about and to also think about how you build the platforms in such a way that it discourages that type of occurrence. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a, definitely easier said than done. There's a story about uh, V Taiwan's platform Polis, which is Taiwan's kind of civic infrastructure. And uh, in order to reduce flame wars on chat conversations on their platform, they removed the reply feature on a lot of the threads, some of the threads. I don't know the details of the story, but but by removing the reply, it meant that you had to go start a new post if you wanted to say something and you couldn't directly reply to something else. So, you know, you, you could like it, you could thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever, but you couldn't reply and sort of uh, pour kerosene on a particular topic. And I, I would never think of removing the reply feature on a conversation because it's like seems like it's essential. Right. Turns out it was actually really beneficial to the cooling of the jets in those uh, forums. Interesting. Yeah. I do well, really I, like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say. I wonder too. And Aram, you may have watched it more carefully because most newspapers have taken. It just takes so much time and effort and energy and staff time to watch and moderate conversations on those platforms. Most newspapers have taken their form out, but it's. I always wonder too if, you know. You see, you see these New York Times articles, you know, back in the day that had 4,000 comments on them. But other than you putting your comment in the box, I, I never got the impression that a lot of people were actually reading them there. They were interacting, but it was, you know, more of a shout box, like I'm going to yell into the great gaping void. 
which may make me feel better, but it's not going to affect anyone else. Um, I have a versus, you know, you throw that into Twitter and Twitter will take it and amplify your speech because of an algorithm and it makes them more money. So I think the other thing we don't talk enough about is there is, you know, free speech is great, but the free acceleration and free reach that the average Joe gets should not be what they're getting. I mean, Jim and Peoria may have an opinion and it may count for something. But he but shouldn't be allowed to reach everybody in the world? Well, yeah, he shouldn't necessarily be able to reach millions of people. Intriguing. The right, the uh, freedom of speech, not freedom of reach. It's right, sort yeah. of the, the uh, tagline there. Um, so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Adam, go. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the other thing that's like interesting here is I will say that, like, actually, users are really engaged in comments. Um, it, obviously, the usefulness of it depends on the site and the audience. But generally, the reason that, like, a lot of publishers took it down wasn't because uh, it wasn't getting engagement and people weren't interacting back and forth, etc. Um, and it wasn't because authors weren't interested in the comments and reading them and reacting to them. It was just because there's no way to moderate it that doesn't require humans and it most papers don't have enough money to do basic shit right. much less comment moderation i mean we still have uh comments on at the washington post and i'd say the other thing that's notable there is like when i was working at for b2b pu publications uh magazines i actually built a wordpress plugin the sole purpose of which was to allow our editors to take the best comments and assemble them into a post on a particular mm. topic. Um, and those were very high engagement. We had really good results from doing that. So people are reading them and interested in them, but it's not necessarily easy to get them moderated. Uh, th there's no way around needing a human for it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. no. Go ahead, Plumson. Yeah, I mean, just on the two technical comments here, I guess, first, like, um, on the moderation burden, it's interesting how that is a common pattern to well everything. A lot of things we discuss today, and a lot of things we discuss usually, I think. Uh, so, um, I uh, so going back shortly to the example of the Big Taiwan uh, forum removing the reply feature. It actually reminds me of what happens in the failures right now, where Mastodon doesn't have the quote tweet or quote post button because of precisely the same reason. So Amazon uh, has the re declined, refused, even a PR, I think, to implement this. Not on technical uh, uh, merits or anything of the kind, but rather, uh, as I remember it, uh, because they, uh, they, it's a feature that can be abused, mm -hmm. essentially. They think it makes it too easy for people to do pylons and, or uh, whatever the term is, uh, bullying. Right. And, and it's uh, to me, I, my reaction to that, in particular, being uh, someone who likes the quote tweet uh, functionality and the fact that, you know, it, it lets you like do threads in two directions, like down and up to some extent, you know, uh, seems quite democratic in principle, you know, you can like, uh, it's like comment and start a new thread. Anyway, um, and you can still, uh, what is there, uh, you can still like copy and paste a tweet and like include a link. So. To me, the, the argument was kind of flimsy, but I, I have heard the arguments about people who say they are happy they haven't done it because precisely of how hard it is to stop abuse in general once you know it starts. And so you know, uh, as a technical person, I lean towards wanted the feature, the feature, but you know, it, it's nice to hear these other um, takes. Then finally, on the moderation issue, the moderation commons is something I've been discussing with people. That it, so. I, I don't want to be the person who takes comments and then asks words, although it's a, there are word policies to generate ideas, but moderation comments as a potential cooperative framework so that, you know, we can make the most of the humans who are willing to do moderation for all, like, you know, society's purposes, essentially. That'd be awesome. Um, it sounds really interesting. I'd love to learn more. 
I have, do with stuff. I have a brief story from the old days, um, early online days. My mom loved political discourse. She was on AOL a ton early on, and her her AOL handle was Ava Marie M. And that that time, the New York Times had their forums on AOL, so she was in there like doing sword duels with the, the right wing people who were nowhere near as right wing as they are now and engaging all the time. And then at one point we went to a Tom Friedman book reading in DC, I guess it was till then. Um, and she went up to sign, uh, sign the book. And I, he, I don't remember how the conversation started. You know, I like, I like posting on the forums or whatever. And he was like, Oh, you're Ava Marie M. It made her year, made her year because he recognized her right from the post on the forum, on the Times forums before they pulled them and, and you know, went uh, to the Times and then they cut them off. And then the second story is she got popular enough that somebody. Uh, somebody created this uh, handle on AOL. AvaMarikM.com, which looks a lot like Ava Marie M. And they started going in and impersonating her and posting as if they were her, saying opposite things to what she'd been saying. And that freaked mom out for a little while, but it didn't last very long. But I was like, well, that's freaking clever. Um, you know, early days of, of uh, impersonation and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But it, I, I learned a lot just watching her do that. Yeah, I, I do think like it's interesting to think about different approaches, right? I think sort of the indie web approach to comments is, I feel like sort of splits the middle there, where it's the idea is you can't, you don't have normal replies on a post. You have to create a post somewhere else um, and then tag it towards that blog. And then it shows up as if it was a reply. And so it sort of has the, the middle ground of you have to go out and create an independent thing but it's still a reply. Hmm. I do see the thing with like, yeah, it's very interesting. I do see the thing with quote tweets though, right? Like it's very easy to be pro quote tweets when they've worked well for you and on you, right? But I I've, I definitely have talked to the people who are like, yeah, the, the main way I see quote tweets used is to like get people focused on harassing a single person. Um, and I think like the choices that the activity pub working group have made around their standard um, and that Mastodon has made around its technology are really interesting, right? So like, because the, those, the people who worked on those projects came from backgrounds where they or a lot of people they knew were getting heavily harassed on the internet. And so activity pub is sort of the most concerned with harassment of any of the social media standards because of that. And I think that gives us a certain like set of things to learn from there in the, in the choices that they make, whether or not we use quote tweets. Um, but the reasoning they have for not using them might inform some future iteration. Completely, yes. I mean, uh, so an activity pub, it's quite flexible. And yes, um, um, I mean, I think Maston made the decision of not having code tweets or code tools. I think some Miski, I think my understanding is it actually implements a code tweets based on activity pub because it's a different kind of activity. So I guess you can just have that. So activity pub supports them, is my understanding. Uh, and, and we were actually discussing uh, the other day with people uh, on the, uh, this idea of the moderation commons about whether activity pub could get be used or be extended to actually make the moderation flows federated as a first you know party first like class uh, kind of event so instead of having people say like hashtag fedeblog etc right you could have instances actually federate their view of where the good and bad instances are right uh, and i will be happy to find uh, more people working on these. Uh, I'm not aware of that being ongoing, actually. It's that's definitely a tough problem, though, because everybody wants to take the easier ways out. And I can create a block list and federate that block list. But if I make a knucklehead mistake, suddenly your favorite friend you don't see anymore, which has happened a lot. So it's you, you've got to go 
past that first level to second and third and fourth levels or mm -hmm. you know do things like you know i i presume email providers take signal google will take signals if i mark something as spam and that exact same thing gets marked as spam by a hundred other people then they can save you know the eyeballs and the time of millions beyond that but mm -hmm. What what level do you throw your signal threshold at? Yeah, it, it goes. It leads moderation. Failure <coughs> moderation leads to algorithms. I mean, which is another of the hot topics in the favors always. You know, the position of like we don't want algorithms, which I do think as a, someone who is in the technology also doesn't to make sense to me, right? Because I, I always try to say there's always an algorithm because you are seeing a sequence of posts. It's just that the default algorithm is very simple, but yeah. you know, like, um, but of course, I also understand that the experiences that people have had with, uh, because of algorithms are, can be very, very negative, so that needs to be addressed. Um, this is where something like Blue Sky seems to have the right approach, it seems, in like allowing for play and play policies, and unfortunately, the, the favors feels a bit conservative to me so far. Or does the federate does the Fediverse seem conservative because of the view you specifically have of it not seeing the entirety of the Fediverse, which is the other thing is the what is your bubble perspective of that thing? Completely. Um, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I'm part of the moderation team of Social Coop, so I, I do see some of it. I mean, I don't know. I say I do. You know, like, but it. The, I, I mean, people get can be, be really mean. Yes, uh, uh, but I, I guess I wanted to say like, for me, like we should be focusing on building the right tools and technologies so that, you know, communities at risk can man navigate this trade off, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, when I when I help moderate social coop, I would love it to make it easier to say, oh, I moderating this crappy post by a Nazi means that all my friend instances won't see it, right? So uh, this is the kind of thing that algorithms can do. Mm -hmm. And none of us is a woman. And I think women's experience online is really dramatically different from men's. Yeah. And so there's a lot of issues there as well. I remember long ago thinking when, when MUDs and MOOs and text-based games were popular, which seems like a very long time ago, um, I remember uh, talking about this to other people saying, hey, what this means is that people can go online and they can adopt a persona. And I guess this is true of avatars later where you pick your gender and make your avatar. Um, but they would, they would accidentally step into the, men would accidentally step into, the, into women's shoes and then walk around online and, and see what happened when people think that you're a woman. And I think that, that was a, a good accidental lesson for the men. Uh, in the sense of uh, they might not otherwise have any way of experiencing that or noticing that that matters. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, we should totally invite different people from our demographic into these conversations. Uh, yeah. So can love. we do it now? I don't know. <laughs> or maybe in the matter, I don't know. Um, because it has been a recurrent topic. Yeah. Yes, it makes sense. Yeah, my dog wants to participate, but well, I don't think she's saying anything useful. But, and, and I'm not sure we're talking about species diversity. <laughs> Although they're using AI to try to talk to communicate to animals now, which is kind of cool. It is cool. Uh, I mean, I think it's the same thing. Have you ever seen those videos of like the cat buttons? Yeah, yeah. or the dogs. Yeah, I've seen yeah, dogs, dogs. I've seen dogs trained to, to hit buttons and say, "Play now, mm -hmm. throw a ball, yeah. give food." Yeah. Yeah. Let me out. Uh, my favorite was the dog. The the dog wanted something, and the human was not engaging. So the dog went over and pushed pushed the buttons that essentially said the phrase "me no love you." Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I hadn't seen that one. It's I mean, heartbreaking. <laughs> you can always say like they're pushing at random and seeing what happens because it, usually interesting stuff happens. But then, do, are we too different to that? In particular, when growing up, no. Maybe that is a reinforcement loop we we go through. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think that it's a little different. Yeah. 
Hmm. Um, what other topics do we have that are Fellowship of the Ling-ish of interest? What else is happening in our worlds? So I will only, always, I, I, I'll shut up in a, two seconds, but I will always try to push a bit the thread of like, what can we do together or what do we do together? Because I always feel like we are, I mean, I, don't, I know the competitions are very high potential and like, I always learn a, learn a lot. So they don't need to change. Uh, yet I feel that, you know, with all these opportunities we discuss and so on, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of feel that there, there, there could be more we could be doing. And my always open offer on that front is I want to intertwinkle my note taking with your note taking. Yes. Being everybody's. Um, and, and that's part of the reason I was interested in, in Agora and learning more about how you've implemented it, because it felt like that might be a way of doing that, that, that we could intertwinkle through the Agora as a media, as a connective medium, maybe, or something else. But, but I'm, I'm always deeply interested in doing that. We haven't done it much. I don't, I don't feel like my note taking is connected to anybody else's. I feel like I'm sort of off on my own, still doing, doing this obsessive thing all the time. Um, and it would be really neat to, to then be able to experiment with uh, different ways of, of uh, talking or improving materials together or whatever. Um, have, I, have I explained the Neo Books uh, project in this call yet? Yep. Yep. Uh, it's been a while. But... Should, yeah, should I do a little refresh? Yeah. Because uh, it's, get, it's getting kind of interesting. We're not, we're not at the point where we've solved the thing yet, but... Uh, on Mondays at 10.30, uh, I host a call where we're busy trying to, and it's just a couple of us there, we're busy trying to write a book, except it's a neo book. It's, a different, it's different from a normal book. And the idea is that, um, first of all, that a book is a roll-up of nuggets uh, that then gets spit out into book format, but that those nuggets live online where each of the nuggets can be improved over time, connected to resources, connected more interestingly to conversations, or could itself be the hub of a conversation around the topic that that nugget cares about. Oh, good. Thank you. And so, um, and one of my ideas is that neo books are a way of leveling up media. And what I mean by level up media is I did a short video, I did a YouTube short that says uh, the, the internet is stuck in mainstream media metaphors. We basically uh, have, we have newspapers, movies, radio, TV, uh, books, magazines, and what else? Early filmmaking. That's the one right there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's exactly it. And, and so neo books are one way to break through some of those boundaries and try to think differently about what a book is and using books as a shiny object, because people know what books are. They're, you know, very well-known cultural objects, but they're, they're a gateway drug to the sneaky thing that's more interesting, which is the online connective participative conversation where we solve stuff together. And also one last point on neo books, uh, they should be authored in a way, and I'm, I'm finding this challenging, but not impossible, uh, to be composable. And I think compo we've talked about composability here a bunch, but they sh we, so neo books should be authored such that any of the nuggets could be repurposed or reused by someone else writing a different book. So I'm writing a, a, a little node of a, a cluster of things around trust because I'm trying to write a neo book around design from trust to get something in the world that, that actually says what I think about design from trust because it's been, it's been perking mm -hmm. around a bunch in, in, in the ether. And uh, there's a, a, a several nuggets that are just going to explain some interesting takes on trust that could be reused by people writing other books that are, happen to want to do something about trust. Similarly, if uh, you know, 30% uh, of all books published in 2023 will likely need to explain ChatGPT, wouldn't it be cool if there were a series of very beautifully done nuggets that could be reused? And and there's a there's a taboo in book publishing, and I may be overstating this, but I don't think I am, there's a taboo toward reuse. Like the idea that one or three chapters of this newly published book might already have existed as chapters in the world is not supposed to be a thing because books should be completely original works. And I'm mm -hmm. like, no, that's stupid. A book is just a path through a bunch of ideas. <clears throat> and if I know that I've read these three chapters, then I can just check them off and say, gosh, I know those already, great. I wanna see what else this person is saying. And so, for instance, one of the people writing a, a neo book in our little uh, calls on Mondays is Klaus Mager, uh, who is a, a guy who's done lots of food service in, in his life and then retired out and realized that 
oh my God, all the stuff I've been doing in food service was screwing up the world uh, and is now trying to fix that through regenerative ag. So he's writing a, a quick first book, a neo book around uh, regenerative agriculture, but he wants to apply uh, spiral dynamics as the model for how to figure out what to say to what audiences. And I'm not a giant spiral dynamics fan, but it's a totally interesting quest and he's using chat GPT to generate a lot of his text. So it's gotten really interesting. And we have a, in Google docs, we have a, a manuscript partly because Klaus is not handy at using obsidian, which is the thing I'm using mm -hmm. to try to edit the individual nuggets. And so mm -hmm. I can easily envision, and I probably won't take time to do it, somebody else writing a book, taking the fir first half of his book and then saying, yes, but let's use um, the, what's the name of the, the, the couple that do the logical reasoning framework? I'm, I'll look it up, but um, let's use a different framework than Spiral Dynamics to go figure out what to do. And those books coexist in a family or a suite of books that are trying to solve the problem just in different ways. And, and, and each champion of a different output or outcome or method would then be the author of that separate Neo book, but they would all be in community because they're all trying to solve the same problem. Sorry for the long-winded explanation, but that's, I'm, try, I'm trying to figure out different ways of leveling up our media, and that's an important one for me. Makes sense. Uh, I am all for that. Um, and I guess, um, the idea, and we have discussed the idea of like turning paths through digital gardens or rains into other kinds of like presentations. And maybe like this idea of like going from, you know, a, 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 like a nugget or snippet to like a, a note to essay to chapter or, or whatever the pipeline is in either direction. Because of course, as a reader, you may go from someone else's essay into your own note and so mm -hmm. on. So this uh, sort of like graph of like the, the byproducts of our um, understanding, mutual understanding is fascinating. Um, on the Neo Books uh, project, I, um, I will be interested to see, I think you mentioned that you were trying to write a few of those already. And those are not in the, the Relate Wiki, they're in the OGM Wiki. Which oh, is, yeah. Which is, so, which is maybe I think so, so, I so the new pages I've just been adding are not in the relate wiki, which is, I, I hate wiki boundaries. That's another issue we should talk about someday. But Wait, yeah. real quick, what do you mean by wiki boundaries? I know. So uh, I, I, I have something that will, as a question that will pull it all together. And I think, oh my God, go for it. So, Jerry, your problem while you're in the brain is, for me, it's all out of sight is out of mind. Right. So I have built into some of my own personal wiki pages links that, as I scroll down the page, encourage me to go look at the Agora and what's there, what's available. Because even having your own wiki, it's tough to get into the habit and practice of searching my own database first yeah. and through a lot of work and a lot of practice i've gotten very good at it and that by itself is super helpful but it also becomes more helpful to have the road sign in my way to say hey go see what these other people who i know and trust and think are doing interesting work are doing so how do you when you open up the brain where is your signpost that says, don't just live here, but go look and see what is on Wikipedia, what is on Relate, what is on Open Global Mind, or in the Agora, which are in each one of those have their own boundaries. And you have to leave one to go to the other versus if you're working, the or, yeah, if you, well, it, but no, I'm not. <laughs> so what I, you know, I may have something that ends up in the Agora, but where I work daily and you have you have that benefit. So you don't notice it as much flouncing because you're working in it natively. Yeah. So you see it. How do other people get that same affordance? How does Jerry's brain get that affordance? He could, you can take data out of the brain and put it into the Agora, but that doesn't mean Jerry's seeing it or has the ability to interact with it. So how do you build that UI to, to help 
foster that to happen. One quick answer, then I'll pass to Flancian. Um, I, I feel like one of the major reasons why I love the brain so much is that it gives me <clears throat> that neighborhood perspective where um, I use the brain and I refer to it constantly as a first source. Uh, and whenever Fl Flancian would post something or, or somebody else writes an essay or you write a blog post or whatever, I connect it in and I try to reduce the number of links you have to traverse to get between any of these things. So I try to make it uh, and I only, I, the, the brain has the ability to display second degree links, but it, it winds up as little tiny text that totally crowds the screen. It's not that useful. So I, only, I need things to be one degree visible, but that neighborhood visibility is, is a really important attribute to me. And I feel like most tools don't give you that because you're always in a document and it might have links to other documents, but you're not seeing the collection of documents. You're in yeah. one document, which is like a wiki page. And so a lot of my links go out to Wikipedia pages, for example, which I really like, but, but the neighborhood concept is super important. That's one of the affordances you get out of having a, a paper-based Zettelkasten like Lumon. Mm. When you go look at something, usually you're looking at two or three or more cards really quickly, and you're seeing these are the ideas that live in the same neighborhood as the one I'm looking for. I need to watch somebody's video of a better experience of Zettelkasten because all I know of it is that there's an encoding of links to other cards on a card, but I don't know of the mutual viewing of a bunch of different cards automatically somehow. I would love that. Yeah, um, most, most digital products don't do it. You can force, Obsidian has a version of it, but like the brain, you have to say, only show me things one link away from this and you have to actively either have that open or force it to be open to see it to see those and most people are not doing a, you know the the paper version um so you don't you wouldn't see me have that experience although i have that same experience in in the analog version of for what you're talking about and to me that is hugely valuable and a nice setup or when i go to the agora you know flancian has got a little mini graph at the bottom that will show me and quite often just out of curiosity i'll look at that graph what else is out there that i ought to look at or should look at and, and what so that becomes one of those signposts that says maybe you might want to go this direction or that direction that you would never have seen or known those were directions that were even possible. And this is a really nice use case for generative AI, by the way, as a listener function. So, so I, I've thought of what are the ways in which generative AI could be helpful to my, me and my brain, but in general, like having a, a generative AI seeing what you're doing and then going, hey, did you know there's this stuff out there that you might not have thought of? That, that's a terrific use. And also right, like incredible a time sink. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, but like a like a smart clippy. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Come, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yes, a, a, a huge plus one on like I really like the idea of this oh, locality and defining locality, uh, the, a community defining locality. So I can think of two points here or two connections. One related to the previous thread on comments on the internet and how like each comment forum. Each comment like section developed into a forum and newspapers and so on with characters and so on and you know hierarchy or like a status and so on. Um, I think of hypotheses. Uh, of course, things like as well as um, um, these uh, comments provider, those actual comments uh, who was all the rage like 10 years ago, 15. Uh, using Gravatar, I forget the name, but you know, you you could essentially plug in a comment section on any, any page uh, using an iframe or a div, um, in the sense of like bring your own comments or bring your own annotations. Discuss. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Discuss. So uh, it, that didn't turn out so well, I guess. Somehow it was like um, uh, I think it was commercialized and didn't work, quite work out. But like Hypothesis is still there, still a fan, still feel that. Uh, it has a lot of potential and you know it's you know we need to get it there but in the sense of like uh, there's clearly a need for people to uh, because that's why they use the sections when they are available still um, to actually have this community uh, you know like it's interesting in an article interesting in a page right by definition these are people who are share something they're interesting in what they're reading so there's some so much potential there that you know uh, maybe each newspaper each website on the internet 
uh, actually it doesn't it's in staff to to a host because of the moderation uh, tags and so on but you know when you bring your own community uh, i'm thinking of like you know if we all agree to use hypothesis or even a particular hypothesis server and if that is easy so everybody can do that maybe the, the experience we could have going to a site and seeing that you knowing that you can have conversations in a safe space actually not only a space associated with the page but also a safe space right um, um i think that's completely untapped essentially um and, and going back to the uh, physical location to close the this idea of the custom you know like the index cards that are adjacent or you know the context the, in in a graph of links um uh, there's like the so the, the, one of the things I wanted to explore with our hour, like there are many, was you know what is left and right of a web page. What is above and below? What is uh, you know on the third dimension overlaid? The browser is being such you know that like we have tabs, we got tabs, sure, and then somehow UI uh, like seems like uh, they stop innovating browser providers. So we have uh, some extensions that we care all the time. And, you know, uh, we, we it's not clear, uh, you know, what is around each page precisely. You have to go out of the page and say, search a Google or a Bing or whatever to find another page related. Mm -hmm. But somehow the browsers don't actually surface related content or anything or like in LinkedIn. Um, and that seems like a huge opportunity, you know, like, uh, uh, to like just explore with UI, I guess. Um, yeah. uh, but I plus one to new books, essentially. Mm -hmm. Maybe good. Thank we you. Could, could we do the maybe next call? We could do an exercise in like turning to draft one, or I don't know how it works. That'd be cool. Um, Chapters. Yeah. So. Um, I can sort of do a guided tour of, of where I think where I think we are. We're trying to come up with a short book that is nuggetized in some sense, sort of deconstructed. And the irony is that you could go from a, a Google Docs draft straight to some kind of output uh, and make a book. No big deal. But I'm trying to add in the extra step of deconstructing the draft or writing originally in smaller chunks, which is the way I'm, I'm going about it. But, but the two other people who are in the, these conversations, neither of them is, is a real uh, uh, Obsidian fan. Or, or, and, and they're not thinking as much in chunks as I am. So the other question that comes up a lot is, gosh, am I, am I working too hard on this in a way that nobody else is ever going to want to do? Like, mm -hmm. you know, because okay. writing chunkily or writing wickily or thinking wickily is a little bit of an art. Um, anyway. Um, but I could sort of do a walkthrough. And then Aram is mentioning Hypothesis, and I was like, it's funny that I've installed Hypothesis, I never use it. Um, it's open source. It should be a place where we can meet and connect and, and sort of connect our notes and stuff like that, but somehow weirdly it isn't. Why is it not more of a glue for us? I mean, I've never heard of anyone self host I mean, I'm sure if there's a way, I guess maybe there's a way. I just was unaware that you could self-host a hypothesis server. I'm, I'm less worried about self-hosting than I am about just the use of hypothesis in general. Well, but oh, that's why I'm resistant to use. Yeah, gotcha. So, <laughs> I think this is open people. source and you can download and compile and run your own server. And I know a handful of people who do. Oh, okay, cool. But the technical hurdle of doing it and maintaining it is pretty high. Not low. The admin tax is not super great. But I what you're saying with NeoBooks reminds me, and I put a link to a JPEG into the chat. And it's a photo from a Time magazine, no, Life magazine in 1948 of on either side, the two big people are Mortimer Adler and Robert Hutchins. And the 26 people who compiled the 102 great ideas. So in front of them is their shared wiki written on index cards mm -hmm. and cool. cataloged by group. And then Adler and several of them then use that to create articles that then made the two 
the volume two and volume three, the Centopicon that was part of the 54 book, you know, great books, of the Western world series, but essentially they were taking excerpts of books that they were reading and writing notes on them and then filing them. And then as a group, they were pulling those things out and collating them per box to write long articles on those topics. Hmm. So they were sorting, going through all the slips that were in the box and then turning them into articles that were well indexed against all the rest of the books that followed. Um, but it then allowed them to, as a group, create a neo book but they were doing this in the 19 the early 1940s and then ultimately released their book books in 1952 i think super interesting uh, and this is Mort mortimer Adler's project yeah so this was the great books of the western world that um encyclopedia britannica put out mm -hmm. um, i'm pretty sure i have a link to that actual article i think it's online it took me ages to find it very interesting it's it's a version of neo books it's just was done in index card format yeah one of the things that occurred to me sort of only recently maybe it's occurred to me a couple different times but it really snapped into place recently was that what i'm doing in the brain and what some of the rest of us are doing in note taking is we are feeding the noosphere we are building the Encyclopedia Galactica of the Foundation series. We are writing Indra's Net. We, we are like there's three or, three or four or five big and beautiful. Um, uh, the glass bead game maybe from Magister Ludi, um, but you know, the, Hesse. yeah, from Hesse. Um, th there's a, a bunch of really like large scale ep epic stories and a few kind of attempts at creating this this big encyclopedia. And I like those. I, I, I feel like, you know, the noosphere is where I'm operating. I, I'm, I, what, a tagline I, 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 I'm, I'm playing with is explorer of the noosphere. Yeah. And I think that, that there's something interesting there because um, noosphere is, is it like this, it's like this flimsy meme. It gets pointed to a lot by people who don't really understand what it meant or what it means or what its potential is, but it's, familiar enough to be in the flow. And I don't know if that's a, if that's a drawback or a benefit. What do y'all think? Well, I, my, and I've read it and looked at it, but my initial gut reaction of no sphere may explain why it's a weird, it sounds like hoo hoo weird, like, I don't know what new age crystals that it doesn't sound, the name is, does not sound serious enough that I want to spend more than a minute looking into it. Interesting. But the idea of what it is is actually supremely interesting. It just has a horrible name, I think, um, because you know, oh, naming yeah. things is hard. This reminds me that there's a very promising pl uh, project called No Sphere already uh, by Gondor. Uh, this reminds me, as in I wrote this down at some point, uh, like like uh, Gordon Brander, who could be yes. an interesting yeah. person to Right, and yeah, he, he's building the Noosphere protocol. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's one of the people who understands it much better than most uh, and is busy building this out. And it comes from an IT suite priest. Ambaya, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a Jesuit priest. Teilhard de Chardin. Also, uh, Vladimir Vernadsky, another interesting character. He also, right. he was he was talking about, so let me uh i don't think i can do an easy screen share here but uh here's a link to vernadsky in my brain he also came up with noocracy which was aristocracy of the wise mm -hmm. so here's the link there we go oh the yeah the noosphere versus the newest sphere sorry i just saw your comment yeah in uh, so I, I would be happy to to explore like any uh, UI allowances that make an uh, it easier to work on a neo book. It's something I wanted to uh, to mention. So for example, like if you Jerry, if you come up, if you have a uh, example fragments from which you would like to assemble, mm -hmm. I don't think it will be very hard to assemble an algorithm, for example, that just shows them as chapters one after the other. Hmm. Like for example, like you know the algorithm already has pools. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you know. 
whenever you pull something above like Gordon Brander or Subconscious, it shows up below us in a reading list. Mm -hmm. So just like having a note that pulls all the other notes will result in them being rendered in the right order. You can achieve the same in Obsidian with uh, embeds, mm -hmm. uh, but this will let you embed things which are in other gardens or in other, in other wikis. Mm -hmm. So if essentially you could say, at the risk of bringing, bringing in yet another complex idea, is this an interesting use of transclusion? This is literal transclusion, yes. Yeah. It's inclusion, but well, uh, the Agora tries to bring out in the whole node. So essentially, everything about X gets brought up when you transclude X. Mm -hmm. I mean, very, very simple. Good. And, and what I, the part of this that I'm most fascinated by or interested in is how it causes us to think and collaborate differently, to think that there could be richly intertwingled documents that are being updated in different ways um, through which we can figure out what we know. That, that my, my goal kind of is to help us know what we know and then push those ideas further in the sense that well, we don't know everything. So what are the questions that come out of this particular experiment over here? Let's set up experiments. Let's set up conversations with experts. Let's you know, debate this so that we can come up with a point of view that's well supported by whatever we think supports it and then mash that up against somebody who has a very different point of view. Yeah. Right. Gonna totally pivot for a moment as we're running low on time and I gotta leave. Pivot away. Um, Flancian, I put in a PR to add context center to the Angora. I was wondering if it was working. Oh, cool. Because I don't know if you noticed or if I lost track of it or I'm looking through I, my open PRs and I don't know what I what happened to it. it oh, yeah, I remember a PR from you for the Agora the link. Yeah. And I didn't make it there. It should have. Uh, oh no, because I didn't restart it. But yes, I did. I did merge it. Apologies for not getting back to you. I merged it, right? And I think it should be available okay. uh, after we speak. All right. I'm I'm curious if it works. Ah, I found it. I found the merge. I don't know what I. Right. Yeah, it should be cool. here. Um, in link I like because I think you added to the link to the other link. As you know, thank you so much. Uh, but I was, uh, I context switched before finishing the task, which was, I know I need to just go and restart the Agora so it picks up the new users. It's like very as simple as that. You have to restart it. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. I, I'm not sure if it'll work. And maybe you've got, once you try it out, maybe give me yes. feedback that says, hey, this works. Or thank you. Work. I'm yeah, curious on you. trying to join it in there. Um, but I'm not sure if my format needs more detail or some other changes or something like that. Uh, I, I took a look and I don't think so, but yes, I, I will gladly do so. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sounds awesome. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And I will, um, so I'll sort of pick this up and offer to do a demo of NeoBooks next time we talk to just show you what's where. Uh, the piece we haven't done yet is when we've done with them. Real quick, I got to drop. I okay. do want the demo of NeoBooks. Cool. Next week. Uh, yes. That'd be great. Thanks, Al. Right. Well, thanks so much. Um, cool. And uh, the, the place where we haven't gotten to yet is rolling up a bunch of nuggets and squeezing them out as a book looking thing. So that's still, right. still on the horizon. You know, you can do, I guess you, um, you know, Pandoc for Markdown to, yeah. Markdown to, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. You are talking, Chris, or? I muted for the dog and forgot. Um, ah, there you go. <laughs> uh, it would be actually interesting too, to even just to be able to take pages from the Agora and cr create a playlist from that that would then spit out a book. Bingo. Yeah. And that would yeah. be that would be an alternate alternate platform for making neo books. And then if the neo books could share nuggets because you're pulling in the same nugget that I'm pulling in in a different way. Yeah. Now we're like right on top of why this matters and, and how it's cool. Hmm, right. That'd be good. Yeah, I thought, I thought for a while, of, uh, because right now you have to write in the Agora and say, pull this and this and this and this, but that requires you to write a new note. But I thought of adding a UI that just lets you like pick the nodes you want to add and then lets you render, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mm. they do it in... It's the, a JavaScript implementation, but you can do custom searches in TiddlyWiki 
that uh, allow yeah. you to pull out you know, a certain list of cards and then you can reorder them. And then the URL itself for that thing then provides you the automatic playlist of read these things and yeah. read them in this order. Like a stack. And then you can yeah. branch off of them if you wish. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, right. We have discussed that. Even as you click through, you could have like a your like sort of like it happens in Fed Week as well. Yeah. Where you get like or, a um, Ward Cunningham's smallest wiki. Right. The, the Fed, you can Fed wiki. Fork or Fed yeah. wiki. I always think of the older name, but you, yeah. can pull, you can pull in the pieces from other people's wikis and then kind of, but there isn't that sense of let's make it in this order or transverse it in this order. Right, right. True. Right. And, and traversing things in a serial order is a stupid handicap, but that's what leads the books, right? But then, but then being liberated of the stupid serial mm. order is what yeah. happens when you go to the nugget that's alive on the web. That's what's cool about making making the link. And also yes. there's a, there's the power of narrative. And narrative is a serial act mostly, except for like interactive drama or whatever else. Right. That, but that didn't work that well. But no. but, but the act of storytelling is choose the your adventure. Choosing, choosing the path. Yeah. Right. I guess I choose your adventure and button languages. Right. Will be the the closer to like an interlinked book, no? Well, I had a conversation last night with another mathematician who was entering an area of math that he wasn't super familiar with. And he's, you know, still a very young guy too. So I said, go back and find an upper level undergraduate textbook because it'll have all the definitions and the theorem proof stuff, but it'll have under each one a whole bunch of examples that you're never going to find in a graduate level textbook. All that stuff kind of gets crunched up and hidden and they either expect you're going to come up with your own to practice and play around with whatever the page you're on. So it, if you know, it's that idea of here's a path through the material, a longer path through the material at the undergraduate level, but the graduate level, concatenates that path and crunches it down and takes out all mm -hmm. the other bits of context and all the other you know little cards that would be in your book hmm. because they either assume you already know it or you would be doing that yourself um right. so in fact i actually pulled two of them out so <sighs> you know th this book is super thick and has a lot of dense you know, material, but this is the undergraduate textbook and the equivalent in this would be, you know, the first 20 pages. Wow. So the first 20 pages are all in here, but the, you know, they just take the cleanest, shortest, straightest path through the right. material. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, cool. That's cool. cool. Yeah. The expansion and contraction of knowledge. Right. But that then also lets you move through a lot more stuff a lot more quickly. Um, I think Ted Nelson had another idea of zippered lists uh, and also expand yeah. expanding texts. Mm, and this is yeah, a little bit yeah. like this is a little bit like expanding texts. Uh, th there's also the notion of and by the way, all this generative AI makes this really easy. Mm -hmm. re I don't know about really easy, but rewriting yeah. all this stuff for different grade levels. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So yeah. so so paraphrase this for fourth graders or, uh, you know. Yeah. You, have you read Neil Stevenson's uh, The Diamond Age? A long ago, yeah. Uh, so there's uh, these uh, the ladies primer, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The young ladies primer. One of the interface to the nose here. Yep. 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 I'm gonna add that to my notes for the call today. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, looking forward to discussing maybe this possible uh, new book. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Maybe we can make a little mini one next time too. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Sounds, sounds great. The, the Neo book of the Friends of the Link. Yes. Uh, that'd be really interesting. Which we could then use to get other people to join us. Yes. Hmm. Exactly. It could be a spoof of the fellowship, of course, of, of, of the ring. Right. So, you know, if you want to make it like really right, I mean, it who, could wants work. To, who wants to be Sauron? <laughs> I think uh, plenty of people want to be certain outside of this group. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, we could have fun there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. We have fun. Well, good. This gives us a bunch to think about between now and next, next, yeah, Monday, yeah. next Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Totally. Yes. Thanks, Marcus. Totally fun. Yes. See you next week. All right. Fun as well. Cheers. Have fun too.